Ben Pro, gee whiz, welcome to the Dylan Friends podcast, mate. Um, yes, I'm very, very excited for this show. Um, I've been a fan for a very long time and to have landed you on this platform, mate, I, I'm absolutely ecstatic. Me too, Dylan. I'm really excited as well. Congratulations on the, uh, on the podcast. So the reason I've gone on it is because I want some of the uh, merchandise that I hear is uh, in hot, <laughs> hot demand at the moment. My three boys are very, very keen. So there's a quick pro quo for this, uh, for this episode, Dylan. Mate, we can, we can sort that out very easily. Uh, that's, a, that's the least I could do for you, mate. And um, don't worry, I'll get, I'll get you and the whole team sorted out in some merch. Um, if that's all it costs, <laughs> then I'm, I'm very excited. Um, mate, normally what I do, um, and I know you would know this being a huge fan of the show, but normally what I do is set the scene... Um, and I like to explain how I first came in contact with, with my guests and how we became friends. Um, for us, it's, it's a little different. Normally, you know, it might be on the footy field, it might be I've met in a club, um, something along these lines. But for us, it, it came from me sliding into your DMs. And basically what I want to know is, obviously you'd get a lot of these, these uh, messages, but myself, a young, handsome man, um, I, I just want to know what were your first thoughts when you had... Me sliding in there, obviously not knowing me from a bar of soap, um, asking you to come on the podcast. Um, it's a really good question. I asked my kids, to be frank, um, have you heard of this guy, Dylan Buckley? Um, I remember in the rooms at the uh, Fire Relief State of Origin game, um, asking my youngest son, Ned, who's that guy that all the players are sitting around? And, and it was yourself. You must have been down in the rooms doing some stuff. So it was the first time I heard your name and uh, a bit of a cult following amongst all the, uh, the teenage boys in, in Victoria. Uh, but then when I heard, um, heard what you were doing with the podcast, and then I asked the kids, why has it been so successful? And they spoke about how real and raw and vulnerable and open you are, um, and how interested you are in, uh, in the various subjects matter. And, and it's probably something that's probably, um, I've been interested in why you've been particularly interested in mindset um, and perspective. And I've seen some of the guests you've had that are also good friends of mine, whether it's Hugh Van Kylenberg and um, the Movember boys, the psychologists there and so forth. And I thought, yeah, it sounds like really, really interesting and very different from typical podcasts and very different from mainstream media. So um, yeah, I was probably intrigued, Dylan, more so than anything else to understand. No, I appreciate that. It's uh, probably a better response than I was um, expecting, to be honest. And even <laughs> for you to, uh, to know my name is is uh is I'm, I'm a bit starstruck now i will i will divulge into that because it is something that's it is really important i think for me and my interest in in this space and obviously getting you on the show um you are you are the goat you are the goat of this this um this area and i think that that's that's definitely fair to say um and we will set the scene on your background a little bit different but i think just to explain to you and the listeners uh, and i think everyone else that they're really interested in this space is for me growing up, I think footy um, and being in an elite sport, it's, it's probably got me to the stage where I was exposed to this sort of thinking. Um, and, it, and it probably exposes you to that a lot quicker than the normal person because you're exposed to so many professionals in this space and performance mindset and, and, and whatnot. And I thought that even though I learn all these things in footy, um, the main, I don't think that I actually use them to my benefit in footy, but I think that I really use them in the benefit of my life. Um, so I think that there's a massive correlation there, which I know that it's a lot of things that you touch on um, throughout your work. But I do want to get into that, mate, because I think, um, you know, you've, you've done so much incredible work. You've had such an interesting journey. Um, I think it might be obviously worth setting the scene on your career to date and to give some, some context on your incredible work. You were, um, you know, early in your career, International Sports Director of Sports Marketing at Nike, which is... It's in itself, that's a podcast there um, to, talk about, to talk about all those stories. And then obviously uh, founded your own company, Unscripted, after that. And now you've moved into this space of obviously public speaking, mentoring, um, and you knew, obviously new work there at Mojo. Can you give us a bit of a rundown of, of how that all transpired? Yeah, I'll try. It's probably more luck than design though, Dylan. Um, I studied uh, at university, I did an arts degree, and I studied... Um, philosophy, anthropology, and English. And I remember thinking at the time, when the hell am I ever gonna use these three disciplines? And I probably didn't realize at the time that one was the study of humans and human behavior. Uh, one was the study of wisdom, and the other one was the study of storytelling. And um, I joined Nike in Australia in the early 90s, and Nike was a very American, probably African-American brand. It didn't have any local heroes. So my job was really just to sign, um, sign athletes to, to the brand and, and help them tell their stories. And that was Nike's competitive advantage 
against the Germans, as we called them, was their, um, their emotional connection with athletes and storytelling. And whether it was Just Do It or Live Strong or Air Jordan, it was the emotional connection with the athlete and the storytelling that became its competitive advantage. And that's probably where I really understood the power of storytelling, I guess, in a, in a commercial sense. Um, and then we started doing life plans for athletes in the early 90s um, and almost like a business plan for, for an athlete, uh, whether it's a, you know, an Andre Agassi or a Roger Federer or a Michael Jordan or a, a Tiger Woods. And that just fascinated me. And it was more so helping them work out their own story first because to become a good storyteller, you need to know your own story first. And, and most of us don't. So that kind of took me on a, a slightly different journey that I didn't really anticipate. And then when I left Nike, I was just, when I came back to Australia, um, the start of the, the 2000s, um, I continued to mentor athletes that I used to work with at, at Nike. And then I guess that morphed into mentoring coaches and then CEOs and then more recently teams as well. And that probably, yeah, led, led me on this journey of internal st storytelling. Because as you said, you kind of got to learn to be a good human first and a good athlete second. Um, and most of us probably don't go on that journey. There's no such thing as fame school where you can learn to be famous. And it kind of dawned on me um, for a multi-billion dollar industry, the rules are pretty embryonic in terms of how athletes turn out. You might be lucky that you've got a good family around you, you know, Pat Rafter on um, Ash Barty and so forth, or you might be unlucky and, and you might get caught up in ugly parent syndrome or just get distracted with all the, you know, the persona and the commercialism that comes with the industry because it's quite surreal and you can get really distracted quite easily. Um, and that's probably led, to, led me on the journey, certainly in the last few years, that, that hobby um, has become a lot more pronounced. And I took a gap year last year to work out what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, there just wasn't that many gaps, so I didn't really grow up, but uh, I continued to explore even beyond sport and did a lot of different things in, in Russia and in London and uh, in Australia as well. And I guess I'm still on that journey, Dylan, to be honest. Mate, it's incredible, and um, yeah, as you said, you've you've worked with so many people and impacted so many lives um, along it. But uh, one thing I suppose it, it's so relative to, to sports people, and I think as we we said earlier, it's not just sports people; it's people in general. Um, is that is the spa is the the space of knowing who you are and knowing your space. You said before, um, you know, sports people often judge themselves on their performance and think that their performance um, correlates to the person they are and that was definitely something that I struggled with early days in in my um, football career for example thinking just because I was playing bad games of footy or um, performing badly on the field that correlated to being a bad person um, mm. I know that that's something that you do a lot of work in how why does that mindset probably happen and how can we we break away from that yeah good question so um Everyone on the planet, um, whether you're a professional athlete, whether you're a corporate athlete, or already a teenager, and I define an athlete as anyone who loves to play, compete, um, and uh, um, play, compete, and work hard, um, defines an athlete. And we're all in search of the same two things, confidence and happiness. And to achieve those two things, we need to ask, answer two simple but not easy questions. Who am I and what do I want? Yeah. Um, answering the first question, who am I, is typically where you'll find confidence, certainly self-confidence and being comfortable in your own skin. Yeah, but, um, but it requires you to take off your mask and, and celebrate your imperfections and find that unconditional self-worth, not determine whether you win or lose a game or sport or what you look like or, or how much money you've got. Um, answering the second question, um, what do I want, is typically where you'll find happiness, especially if in finding happiness, we not only unlock our personal and professional goals, but we also find that sense of purpose and meaning that brings a sense of contribution and, and fulfillment. Um, but you can't work out what you want until you work out who you are. Um, but most of us don't wanna do that because we're shit scared what we might find is maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I'm not loved enough, right? So um, we keep that mask on and that armor on for self-preservation purposes. And if that happens, we typically go external rather than going internal to develop that unconditional self-worth, we go external. And if we do that, that's when we get distracted. And that's when we start um, getting caught up in extrinsic motivations, which is kind of money and fame and status. We get caught up in materialism, thinking that will make us happy. Um, or we get caught up in, in craving recognition, which has almost become a disease now, which is where we're, we're caring what people are thinking about us and saying about us and what are they writing about us in the media or social media. 
as opposed to what I think about myself um, and finding that, that self-worth, if you like. So, and that's probably the biggest opportunity I see, Dylan, for not only every athlete in the world, but every person in the world to go on that journey to answer that first question. Because you know? um, if you do, you'll realize that our life story is not our life. It's just our story, yeah? And we're the author of it. So the good news is we get to write the ending, but the better news is we get to go back to these crucible moments in our teenage years or 20s or 30s where we attached our self-worth to an experience, good or bad, and we get to go back to those stories and we get to reframe or accept or let go or forgive, and we detach our self-worth from those experiences. And through that process, you can reframe and create more positive affirmation-based stories that give yourself permission to be imperfect, but also unconditionally worthy. And that's the opportunity, because as we said, we've got to, be, you've got to learn to be a good human first and a good athlete second. And if you do that, you can find that unconditional love, which is probably the, the panacea for everyone on the planet. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting concept. But I suppose something that I, it's such a, a question of when someone says to you, who are you? You know, what's your purpose? What's your worth? Um, what do you want to do? These questions like, you know, we chatted off air um, a couple of days ago before you came on the show and you asked me these questions and I like to think that, you know, I'm pretty in tune with, with myself and where I want to go and what I want to do. But I, I, I find it so hard to actually answer these questions. Like, I don't know what the answers are to these things. Like, is it something that you can work out by yourself or do you think you need to have someone in your life that you can look to to help you, you know, mentor these things um, with, with you on that journey? Yeah, great question. And that's probably, um, yeah, one of the, the classic Aussie alpha male loner mentality who thinks he has to do everything on, on his own and, and is too afraid to ask questions and vulnerability is a weakness. It's probably one of the biggest truisms that no one in this world can do anything in this world on their own. Yeah, we all need friends, we all need mentors, we all need people around us um, because without that, we hope, without that feedback, if you like, we're gonna hope we have a good, pretty good bullshit filter to understand how other people perceive us and how they experience us when, um, when we show up in the world. So yeah, it's a, and unfortunately there's often, there's nowhere to go to some degree where you can find these almost life skills as I said, there's, you know, there's no such thing as fame school where you can learn to be famous and deal with the persona versus the person. So when these distractions happen, how do you kind of think through them and, and so forth? So yeah, but it's, um, and it's more pronounced in the sports and entertainment industry. Because if you think about it, the sports industry, part of the entertainment economy, and the entertainment economy is effectively the storytelling economy. And whoever tells the best story wins. But if you get caught up in that story, that narrative with those expectations and so forth, which is a formula that drives billion dollar industries and advertising and so forth. But it's really important if you're an athlete to separate what's real from what's not real and then get back to what is real. And through that process, and it's probably the most courageous journey anyone will ever go on, that journey to work out who you are, what really drives you and what are your values and what are your motivations and what are your needs and what legacy do you want to leave the planet? Um, it's just a, yeah, it's a skill set that's probably not anywhere we can kind of just you know, pick up a phone and say, I wanna work out who I am kind of thing. It's a bit of a journey. And it's a mixture of philosophy and psychology and life coaching and leadership coaching and so forth, where some of these answers can be found. I suppose talking about that now, something that you talk about in a lot of your work um, that has obviously drawn me to and something that's really um, made me think about times in my life where things might've shaped me. And you know, I look back now um, to when I was younger and obviously, as, as young people all are, we're, we're pretty selfish and self-centered. We're always thinking about ourselves and, you know, what can I do? What can, how good can I do this? How good can I do that? Can I play a game this week? You know, I got dropped. Um, and then I look back to post that time, sort of probably towards the end of my career at Carlton, where I was probably questioning and, and didn't know if footy was actually, it, it was something that got me to where I wanted to be, but I don't think it was like my why and why I was doing things. And I wasn't probably fully fulfilled with it in terms of, being a footballer, as I said earlier, like I, even though I was a footballer, I found it really hard to escape being known as a footballer. I wanted to be known as a person first and then a footballer second. Um, and I think through that time of probably four years where I was on these one-year deals, um, I didn't have any purpose you know, in my life besides playing footy. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do post-footy. I had no engagement outside of that. Um, all my eggs were in one basket. And 
I look back now with your work, which I'd love for you to expand on, and I know that that's just a journey that we all go through, and those moments shape us to then what we do next. Um, one video I love watching um, you talk about, and I've heard you talk about this a lot, but it's, it's the hero's journey. Um, and I was hoping that you could probably expand on that to give some more context into to what I'm talking about there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, in the spirit of the, um, we are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And, you know, our life story is not our life, it's just our story. There's a beautiful framework uh, created by Joseph Campbell in the 1960s um, that um, Hollywood actually used for a majority of Hollywood blockbusters. Um, and the hero's journey is based on three chapters. Chapter one, it's all about me, I, I, I. So Luke Skywalker, Star Wars, it's all about him. He goes off in the desert with R2-D2 and C-3PO and pretty much does whatever he wants, yeah? In chapter two, we start having these crucible moments, um, these life-altering moments, and they're laced with meaning. So in his case, he comes back and his whole family's been killed by stormtroopers. In chapter three, he wants to become a Jedi Knight and save the world, yeah? And it's a beautiful metaphor for how we live our own lives. In chapter one, Right, in primary school, teenage years, it's all about me. Me, 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 I, I, I. I win a race, I get a blue ribbon. Yeah, I work hard at my grades, I get an A. I'm good at my job, I get promoted. We get recognised for achievement and it makes us feel significant, yeah? In chapter two, we start having these crucible moments in our teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s. And they're laced with meaning and we need to lean into these crucible moments because they're either going to hold us back in our life, post-traumatic stress, or they're going to project us forward, yeah, post-traumatic growth. And we need to get through these chapter two in order to get to chapter three. And when you get into chapter three of the hero's journey, life is beautiful, life is free, life is easy. It's kind of where, as Joseph Campbell says, that's where we find our bliss, if you like. And when you move from chapter one to chapter three, it's the journey from I to we. And you realize another one of life's great truisms that life's not about you. Life's about the impact you can have on someone else's life. Yeah, to care about them, to serve them, to love them, to be interested, not interesting. And when you're in chapter three, to your point, that's kind of where our purpose gets revealed, that sense of meaning, that sense of fulfillment, that sense of contribution. <laughs> yeah, but most of us are stuck in chapter one or, or chapter two. We think it's about us. Yeah, do something for me, make me happy. We get caught up in self and craving you know recognition of self and so forth but if you can make sense of chapter two these crucible moments you'll realize that it's not the experiences of our life that determine our life that shape our life it's the meaning we put behind the experiences yeah the narrative behind the experiences the stories we tell ourselves about the experiences but there's all these arch archetype hero archetypes as we call them that can hold us back from getting out of chapter one and ch shut up siri get out of chapter one and chapter two into, into chapter three. Yeah, I might be caught up in imposter, imposter syndrome, which you've probably heard of. We don't believe we're worthy of, of this situation or this relationship. I might be caught up in the rationalizer, right? Which means I haven't established my values. I'm making excuses or I'm in denial. I'm rationalizing my, my life away. I might be the loner, which means I haven't got any mentors, right? I'm too afraid to ask for help. I might be the glory seeker, which is the person who wants to get all the credit for everything. And typically it means I haven't, identified my intrinsic motivations, things that really light me up as a person. Or I might be the shooting star. You know, the person wants to achieve a hell of a lot in a quick amount of time, but leaves a trail of destruction and carnage behind him in terms of his family or his friends or his colleagues. And we all have elements of all these archetypes, Dylan, in, in, inside of ourselves. And it's a part of, I guess, that self-reflection, introspection journey to work out where am I in the hero's journey at the moment? Do I still think life's all about me? or? Am I starting to get an inquisitive an interest in helping others and caring for others and, and, and serving others? And when that happens, you start to get out of your own sense of self and you start to focus on, focus on others. And that's a beautiful place. And that's the journey we're all on. Ben, can you talk us through the, the three uh, mindsets, I suppose, you, you cover in a lot of your work that, that relate back to your mantras, obviously, embrace your weird, own your story and find your mojo? Yeah, no worries. Um, so connection mindset is the first one, and that's about you know connecting with yourself before you connect with others, and um, and celebrating your imperfections and, and finding that unconditional self worth. It's not conditional upon you know what you look like, or what you achieve or don't achieve in your life, and so forth. There's no external validation. Um, that's 
one of the most powerful and courageous journeys that anyone will ever go on, that self-reflection and introspection to work out who you, are, who you are, not judged by what you think others expect of you, if you like. Um, the second mindset is purpose mindset, and that's effectively you're just here to show up and make a shitload of money and win, or fundamentally you stand for something, you believe in something, there's something that lights you up, um, and there's a legacy you want to leave the planet. That's probably the highest goal that you can ever achieve for yourself in terms of you know, chapter three of the hero's journey. But purpose mindset also unlocks your goals, yeah, your personal goals, your professional goals, your values, um, your motivations, your needs. Um, and that's very much answering the second question of, of what do I want? And connection mindset is, is who am I? And then the third and final mindset is performance mindset, which is in the moment of performance, how I can focus my attention on the things I can control and the best version of me and not get distracted by the fear of failure or, or focusing on the results. So, and if you can answer those three questions in those mindsets, you know, who am I, what do I want, and, and how do I get there? You're effectively embracing your weird, which is effectively celebrating your imperfections, owning your story, which is owning your unconditional self-worth and not letting your story be determined by others, and then finding your mojo, which I guess as Joseph Campbell was talking about, which is finding your bliss and going on that life journey and that experiment to, um, to make sense of, of your journey. The, the people that you work with, with for these heroes' journeys and, and the coaching and mentoring, um, like some of the names here, like Andre Agassi, Tiger Woods, Ash Barty, just to name a few, I know there's, there's a lot. Um, is this the stuff that you take through with, with these people? And I suppose through that, who would be, if you're happy to divulge and talk about it, who are some of the people that you've worked with that have had the most amazing growth um, through this? I guess Ash Barty's, the speed of her growth has been quite extraordinary from, you know, um, I guess the two bookends of Wimbledon 2018 where um, you know, she got distracted and had a bit of a setback to Wimbledon 2019 where she rocks up as the number one tennis player in the world. Um, and the journey of working out who she was and embracing vulnerability as a strength has been quite exceptional and but probably no different from, you know, Trent Cotchin and, and the Richmond boys in terms of the, the rapid turnaround from 2016 into 2017, if you like, and the incredible connection that they found, you know, celebrating their humour, celebrating their imperfections and so forth, and, you know, embracing vulnerability as a strength. Um, that was quite extraordinary as well. Um, Kathy Freeman's probably my favourite story around handling pressure. And the 2000 Olympics, she was the pinup girl for pretty much every broadcaster on the planet. Right. And then she gets asked to light the Olympic flame. Um, and the way she handled that um, and not getting caught up into expectations. And I remember her saying that, you know, she feels like she's a little girl inside a house and she looks out through the window and she can see this incredible storm molding and she can see it, but she can't hear it. And that was a beautiful way for her to separate the expectations of others and focusing back on what she could control and the way she used storytelling and she created an acronym called FLAG which was representative of the um, Aboriginal flag which she used to break down the 400 metres into four segments and it was an acronym that stood for fly out of the blocks, um, leg speed in the back straight, A stood for attack the bend and G stood for go like hell or, or go girl um, and just the way she used metaphor and analogy and story to focus on the task at hand and not be distracted by the things she couldn't control or the expectations of others. Um, certainly myself, I think it was the first time I cried in a, in a stadium was that, that night at, the, at that race. Um, Andre Agassi is probably the, the greatest story in terms of um, the hero's journey, if you like, um, from trying to work out who he was and, and being celebrated as the, one of the most famous athletes on the planet, but getting caught up in the persona, if you like. and. It's quite a surreal industry, as you know, the entertainment industry, and a lot of his life was a lie, if you like, in terms of uh, you know, the persona, his relationship with himself or with his first marriage to Brooke Shields or, or with his parent. Um, and he got this wildcard tournament. He blew out right to 141 in the world. It was really hard to live an inauthentic life. And he blows out to 141 in the world and he gets this wildcard to this tennis tournament in Stuttgart, Germany. And he loses in the first round um, to a kid who's ranked 400 in the world. And then his coach sacks him. So it's a, fair to say he's at a pretty low ebb at this stage in his life. And he remembers standing in the hotel room in Stuttgart, Germany. He looks out the street and he can see all these 
people walking and it looks like they know where they're going. Yeah, metaphorically, it looks like they've got their shit together and he's never felt that way. And he goes, what if I work out who I am and what I want to do? Right, even if that means giving up tennis. And in that moment, he connected with his aha, his sense of purpose. He also connected with his shame. Uh, the number one fear for men worldwide is looking weak. The number one fear for athletes is being dumb. The number one fear for women is body image. Right? And he never wanted to feel that way anymore. He didn't want other people at risk of not getting an education to, to feel that way either. And in that moment, he sent, sent a sense of purpose and meaning to why he was playing tennis and dedicated his tennis career to a higher purpose. But his whole life turned around in that instant. He found life, he got fit again, he got healthy again, he created a team around him, he was the first tennis player to say, we, not I. He found love, he found Steffi Graf and had two beautiful kids with Steffi. He got back to number one in the world, he won another four Grand Slams, second time around. And as a consequence of connecting with his purpose around education, he set up a billion dollar business and set up 64 charter schools across North America with Michelle Obama and a bunch of other ambassadors. So. In terms of that against the odds romance and that hero's journey, um, Andre is probably one of my one of my more, more favourite stories. Ben, obviously we're both uh, in the sports industry, and you you know you deal with a lot of sports people, um, sports professionals. Something that's you know happening of late, which you're more than aware of, and, and have been dealing with a lot of athletes that go through these things. But a lot of guys are and girls are, are, are leaving the sport early. Um, they're losing their passion for playing sport, or they're taking time for mental health leave. Um, why, do you, why do you think that that is? Yeah, well, I can't talk to the, you know, the specific issues from a, from a mental health point of view, but what I, can, what I can say at a macro level, Dylan, is that so many of us are getting, and so many athletes are getting caught up in the demon of expectations, right? These unrealistic expectations of others that are thrust upon us that we believe they're real or expectations of of results and that demon of expectation getting distracted by the persona of who we are and believing that's real right to the determinant of, of who we actually are and as, as humans more so and because we're getting distracted by these expectations that we can't live up to it's easier to walk away from the sport right rather than understanding what's real and what's not real right whether it's media whether it's social media whether it's parents whether it's coaches and so forth and really separating goals from expectations. But if you believe their expectations, right, that you can't live up to, that pressure, that anxiety and stress makes you wanna walk away from the sport, as opposed to understanding what you can control and what you can't, what's real and what's not real, the persona versus the person, right? And the courage is to put these goals out in the universe, but no guarantees or expectations that you'll, uh, you'll achieve those goals, if you like. And, in particular, the media, right? And the media industry has become the opinion industry with all these judgments, if you like. And if you believe it's real, like, geez, that journalist really hates me as a person as opposed to, uh, -uh. But unfortunately, they've all got these negative judgments and these negative opinions that we're listening to. And we're unfortunately attaching some of our self-worth to that narrative, right? Which is why I love your podcast, to be frank to kind of educate the entire global sports industry about what's, what's real and what's not real. And the persona is not real. Your identity, your ego is not real, right? You're part of a storytelling economy, right? But that expectation that the media drum up or, or so forth, it's deliberate, right? That's their role. But your role is not to listen to that and get back to no expectations from anyone else. Ash Barty did a beautiful press conference. I think it was the day one of the Australian Open this year. And of course, you know, she's the Australia's great hope. She's the number one ranked tennis player in the world. And she must have got asked about 25 times, you know, how you're dealing with the pressure. And she said, what pressure? Uh, the pressure on myself. And they go, no, no, how are you dealing with the expectations? And she goes, what on myself? And, then she, and they'll go, no, no, the expectations of the whole country or, or the whole world. And she said, um, listen, dude, I can't control what you expect of me. I can't control what you think of me. Uh, the only things that I can control are the expectations I put on myself. And as long as I'm, you know, work my ring off, which is her vernacular for having a crack um, and training hard, right? Or have a crack and training hard. They're the only two things that she can control. Right? Once on that, there's no expectations of others and doesn't get distracted by what people are um, writing or saying about her. It's only the expectations we can put on ourselves. So yeah, this expectation is becoming a disease because it used to mean just the things I can control but we've become distracted because we're craving recognition perhaps 
and we've been distracted by expectations of others thrust upon ourselves and believing they're real. And it's, it's, in my opinion, causing so much anxiety and stress versus just letting all that narrative go, right? And, and staying true to who you are. Accepting the distractions, celebrate the journey that you're on and focus back on, on task at hand is pretty much the formula. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose back to what you're saying about the media, I suppose, of, of not necessarily knowing a person and knowing their purpose or their journey. Um, and I suppose that's probably, as you said, the reason I love, you know, doing the podcast the most is when we when we sit down and have a chat, you know, I always say to them, you know, this podcast is, is only to ever make, you know, tell your story. Like, I'm not here to get a scoop. I'm not here to try and, you know, throw you under the bus. And um, if I look back to a podcast that I probably did that, that fits that, um, sort of thing is I, I spoke to um, a guy that I've loved and respect in Zach Dawson. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of Zach Dawson, but he um, was a, he played for Hawthorne, St Kilda, and Fremantle. And through his career, he's probably one of the harshly most da- um, da- judged harshly the most I've ever seen of any player for you know what he's done and what he's been able to do um, off a, off a few moments that were early in his career. And the person that he is, um, which I've been lucky enough to know, is one of the best blokes of all time. So I think to sit down with him and be able to tell his story and, and people to see him for who he actually is and be able to talk about the moments that were actually real for him and, and how he, he got through those tough times. Um, everything that we've spoken about today, I, I'm you know pretty sure that he had, had to go through that by himself and learn all those things and have all those moments and have the uh, post-traumatic stress versus post-traumatic growth um, and the, the, not that you do it for people commenting and people enjoying the show, but by far was it the most rewarding show that I did because every single person that listened to it, you know, in some way probably felt A, bad, or, two, or, 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 or B, they were just so surprised that someone went through that and was a bit able to, to keep going the way they, way they did. Yeah, totally. It's a, it's a surreal fishbowl industry, yeah? I mean, life demands a heroic response, yeah? Um, and sport can show us how, right? We see our heroes and we kind of aspire in an irrational escapist way to be them, right? But if they're letting us down, it's kind of letting our identity down and so forth. We have this adverse relationship with, uh, with athletes in a, in a bizarre sense. So it's really important if you're the athlete to understand, well, it's just whole storytelling economy, people's identity associated with their football team. So they're not abusing me, they're kind of abusing themselves in terms of their own identity. Mm. And once you can do that, you can have fun and take the piss and tell stories and have a laugh, which is kind of everything you do on your podcast, right? But it's everything around celebrating imperfections. One of my favorite quotes is that there's not a shred of evidence can be found in favor of the idea that life is serious. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was written 150 years ago, but we're all taking life so seriously, right? It's called a game, game principles, play, have fun, compete. Right, childlike, get back to that and the reason you fell in love with the game and make sure you don't get distracted by all the noise or the white noise, as Justin Langer says, that can just be deliberately thrust upon you to create controversy, to create cortisol when you're reading this article on social media to have an opinion and leave a, and leave a comment, if you like, which is, becomes a dopamine cortisol hit, which is why we're all seeing getting caught up in, in opinions and judgments in this politically correct, sensitive, litigious world. The media are playing upon it, but we're becoming pawns, getting lost in that narrative as opposed to owning our own story, right? And separating what's, what's real from what's not real, if you like. So I think that's the, that's the wonderful opportunity that your podcast can deliver is create more human connection and, and understand the story behind the story, if you like, of the characters and understand what their frailties are, their vulnerabilities and, and when they're getting distracted if you like, because we'll learn a hell of a lot for, through, through those stories in terms of our own lives and take a little bit about that with, with us and kind of shape, shape who we are as humans. Yeah, and I know how, how much you, you, you know, are into the storytelling and how much you love that and, and bring it out of players and build the story. Obviously, that would come back from your Nike workings. But it's funny, I was actually, that we're chatting about this now because I was chatting about this with a mate yesterday and um, we were saying... It just sort of hit me because at a stage when I started the podcast, I was probably at that time in my life where I thought, I just don't care what anyone thinks anymore. Like, I'm already not, I've already been delisted once. I'm not getting a game. There's only so many times where people can, you know, bag me for doing media and not playing. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to start a podcast. I don't, I really don't care anymore. But there would have been the, f- I was in a mindset where I was so, you know, keen to do this that I just totally forgot that people would be judging me 
the way that I was doing it. And I only look back now and think far out, like how many people would have been saying that bloke is the biggest loser? Like he's already been delisted once. He's not getting a game and now he's going and starting a podcast. But one thing that taught me out of that was if you do something with conviction and you do it, you don't question it, people just get out of your way and they don't move. And I think that, uh, so they get out of your way and they just accept that, you know, that you're going to be doing this and they jump on board. Um, so I think the conviction's the biggest thing that I've really learned. When you do something, you just got to do it and not question it. And I suppose even now, I know you're a big fan of American sports and you look at a couple of guys in the NBA. Um, is it Matthias Thibault? They, they've started a, a, a YouTube um, channel where they've been, you know, showing their lives and what they're up to and people are so relating to this content because it is showing their storytelling and people are loving it. Um, and it really shows the power of, you know, people being able to tell your story. And you see now in the AFL, there's guys that are starting their own podcasts. Um, Mitch Robinson's one that's been doing some good things. Um, it's just been getting more and more, I think, from, from people doing it because guys are sick of their story being told by the media. They just want to tell it themselves. Yeah, totally, totally. And it's effectively, what you're talking about now is effectively, you know, the definition of connection. Yeah, I mean, connection is why we're here. It's why we exist on the planet. We're neurobiologically hardwired for connection. That gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Shame is the fear of disconnection, right? that I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough to be connected to you and so forth. Um, and if you can find opportunities and avenues through these YouTube channels or these podcasts and so forth, we create human connection and where you can celebrate your imperfections and identify all those frailties and vulnerabilities, that authenticity, if you like, that leads into celebrating imperfection. And through that storytelling, we relate as humans to, um, to them on a human level. And they take off the mask and they find the story behind the story that makes a connection on a, not on a football or a sporting level, but on a human level, if you like. And that's the opportunity for, for sport is to find the stories behind the stories to make that human connection, if you like, more so than the transactional kind of sporting connection of whether I, I play well or don't play well on the, on the football field. And because we, we see ourselves on those journeys and we see ourselves both good and bad in terms of those um, athletes falling down and what they've learned from it and hoping that we can become a little hero with a little H when we, we see these big heroes with a, with a capital H, if you like, and aspire and emulate to those journeys. So yeah, the, the realness is really, really important. Um, a lot of your notoriety, I suppose, like how we know you in, in Australia now and how I came across, obviously, through the Australian sort of media, has been linked to working with Richmond. And you've been widely noted and publicly noted to have been something, uh, a person that's helped them um, change their club around and the success that they've had in the last few years. Um, closely working with, obviously, um, Dimmer and Trent Cochin. Can you talk us a little bit about that and how did you get involved with, with the club? Yeah, uh, first of all, all the credit should go to, to Richmond, you know, to, to Peggy and Brendan and, and uh, Damien and Trent. They, they've done all the heavy lifting, if you like. Um, and Richmond have an amazing um, philosophy of ours, amazing what can be achieved when no one cares who gets all the credit. So that sense of humility and grounding. And they've got amazing people around the club as well, whether it's Shane McCurry, who, um, who runs the leadership program, and Emma Murray, who runs the mindfulness program as well. So. Um, yeah, I was working with Peggy, um, uh, mentoring role, and had done a lot of work with Brendan as well. And um, I started mentoring uh, Damien and Trent at the end of 2016, that uh, kind of train wreck year. And um, they really lent into these themes of authenticity and vulnerability and celebrating imperfections and identifying shame and letting it go and, and kind of the reframing, if you like. And both of them finding that sense of purpose and meaning beyond themselves, um, and uh, yeah, through that journey, uh, 2016 and 2017, um, both Damien and Trent just unlocked this amazing connection, first with themselves, um, and through that embracing imperfection, and, and created permission and safety for the rest of the organization, if you like, to celebrate their imperfections as well, and find that connection, that human connection more so than um, than football in terms of their relationship and their perspective about what's important and what the end goal was, so to speak. But yeah, that was a, a wonderful journey. And I think in their own way and in their own words, when a leader gets up and, and, and says, so I'm so sorry, I thought I had to be the perfect leader. I'm here to tell you that I'm not, I'm imperfect and I'm full of struggle and I don't have all the answers and I can't do this on my own. Um, um, but I also know that I'm worthy of your love and belonging and connection and taking you on a journey 
Um, and then, you know, obviously seven months later, they, they won the unwinnable premiership and, and Damien and Trent went from, you know, unofficially the worst coach and captain in the AFL to officially voted by their peers as, you know, the best captain and coach in the AFL. Um, and that's, yeah, I guess a beautiful example of individuals who go back and answer that first question, first and foremost, who am I? And then can overlay that with um, the persona of who they are as a, as a footballer or as a coach. Um, and then create permission and safety for everyone else to do the, the same thing as well. Because it's our imperfections that connect humans the most, Dylan. Unfortunately, we're also caught up in this perfection myth, right? Um, but if you, you know, if you think about your relationship with your mum or your, your family, or think about your relationship with your best mates, it's the little things, it's the nuances, it's the idiosyncrasies, it's that self-deprecating humour, it's the in-jokes, it's the stories, the laughter, the tears, that's the gold. We call these things imperfections, but it's actually imperfections that connect humans the most, yeah? Um, you're seeing it now with the pandemic, or you saw it with the bushfires, if you like, the imperfection of the planet actually brings humans together a lot more. So it's counterintuitive, unfortunately, but when you embrace some of these themes and create permission and, and safety for everyone else to do the same, it's extraordinary what can be um, created. And I think that's what uh, Damien and Trent did such a beautiful job of. It's, it's such an interesting point to put it like that. Um, I've, I've actually never thought about it like that in terms of the friendship and family and you know, those people are the ones who know you the most and so well. Um, and that's why your relationships are obviously the strongest. So the more that we can obviously be like that on, on a larger scale, whether it be in a team or just to our networks, the more better connections we're gonna have. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. One of the success of your podcast, um, Dylan, is that you celebrate imperfections. And through that, that's where the humor is, yeah? But that's where the storytelling is. That's where the, the realness and the rawness and the vulnerability is. And as, as humans, we absolutely crave that. So if you can create an environment where I don't have to be something or care what people are thinking about me, it's what I think and say about myself that, that really matters and, I, and you can be authentic. Because um, if you don't, you start you know, wanting to fit in rather than, rather than saying, uh-uh, I already belong. Fitting in and belonging are directly opposite. When you're f trying to fit in, you, you're caring what people think about you. And as soon as you do that, you lose your only competitive advantage. Yeah, you lose your authenticity because there's only one you, right? But you create safety and permission yeah. to, um, to you know, celebrate your imperfections, embrace vulnerability and say, uh -uh, I belong, this is who I am, this is me. And I've got safety just to be me. It's, um, it's quite powerful. That, that one hits me in the feels a lot because um, one thing you mentioned there is there only, there only is one you. And the, show, the motto of this uh, show is be yourself, everyone else is taken, which is, which is a funny one, but it actually is just, it's actually a fact. The other point there, what you said was um, about the ability that you want people to like you um, and fit in. I think if I look back to, to like my early days of coming to an AFL club and I think that that 18 year old stage um, is such an important time because all I wanted to be was liked. And I think that, you know, I, well, I rocked up, I just wanted to do things that the other guys were doing to be liked. And I thought that that was gonna get me to where I wanted to be because you had friends there, but Little do you know, you fast forward, you know, two, three years down the track and you learn these things by stuffing up and having these crucible moments. The only thing you want to be is respected because I think when people, um, and this is what I've learned, when, you, when you've got a problem or your friend's got a problem, they don't want to go to the person that they like. Um, they want to go to the person that they respect. Um, and I think that, you know, by having those things and staying true to yourself, that's probably something that just on that topic, I think... Um, something that I've really gathered in my sort of last three years on, on that sort of scenario. Yeah, absolutely. The, the most important, the most powerful form of respect is self-respect. Yeah, the most powerful acceptance is self-acceptance. The most powerful for, version of love is self-love. Um, and if you can love yourself unconditionally, yeah, there's no conditions. It's not based on what people think about you. It's what you think about yourself. It's not based on what someone says or writes about you, it's what you say to yourself. And if you can find that unconditional self-worth, you let go of caring what people think about you. Yeah, it's what you think about yourself. But if you can't let go, if you don't believe you're enough, you'll then get distracted. You're wanting to fit in, caring what people are thinking and saying about you and try and be that person. So it's very much about finding that, you know, that unconditional self-worth, if you like. And um, the two pillars that are driving this shame epidemic, one is this perfection myth where I feel like I have to have the perfect relationship or be the perfect footballer, have the perfect career, the perfect house, the perfect body, 
you know, the perfect relationship, the perfect marriage, I the perfect marriage, like the perfect divorce, yeah? And we're all, you know, putting <laughs> stuff from, from our butt into different parts of our body and, and anatomy in terms of that perfection of body image and so forth. And it's, perfection doesn't exist. It's not real. It's this external manifestation that can never be achieved. It's bullshit, right? And the antidote to the perfection myth is to celebrate imperfection because it's imperfections that connect humans the most, as we discussed. But we've also got this scarcity mentality, this feeling that I'm not good enough, loved enough, successful enough, smart enough. I go through the whole day feeling like I haven't achieved enough and I wake up in the morning feeling like I haven't had enough sleep. You know, that constant not enough, never enough. And the antidote to that is literally the ability to say and know and believe, I am enough. <laughs> yeah, that's it, I'm enough. I'm imperfect and I'm full of struggle, but I'm unconditionally worthy. And if you can hold on to those two thoughts at the same time, celebrate our imperfections, but our unconditional self-worth, you've got all the power in the world, yeah? And that's the journey that we're all on, is to, is to hang on to those two thoughts at the same time. And if we can do that, then we, we stop craving recognition, we stop caring what people think about us, and that's when we can you know, embrace our weird and own our, own our story and, and find our mojo. Um, I love that. You've just used your own mottos in there as well. We obviously, embrace your weird being uh, the main one. It's on your shirt at the moment, which I absolutely love. Um, the, the story there about um, you know, knowing that you're enough, you obviously tell a really cool story with that that I've heard in the past because you're moving now into talking to some schools. Um, and there's a story of a young girl, which I'm hoping you're happy to talk about, um, you know, obviously without naming names, but in that, you know, in that same scenario um, of, of knowing that you're enough in, in a friendship group, um, would you be happy to sort of talk about that? Yeah, no worries. Um, in the gap year that I took last year, I just wanted to do a whole lot of different, I guess, experiments, yeah. Um, so I went to Moscow and spent a day over there with 500 CEOs on, on vulnerability, which was a life altering um, experience and, and spent time with special ops groups in, in police forces and started mentoring a lot of CEOs in, internationally and, and started working with teenagers as well, because I was just really keen if I could um, transfer a lot of these principles and see what impact it would have, not just on professional athletes and teams, but at different audiences. And I spoke to um, about 500 teenage girls aged 13 to, to 17 at this school um, and I just wanted to teach them two things. I wanted them to call bullshit on perfectionism and to be able to say, I am enough. And I wanted them to draw down on a series of words that if they were getting nervous before a race or nervous before an exam that reminded them of the best version of themselves and not get distracted. And um, I then went overseas for a few months with um, the Australian cricket team and, and Ash Barty. And yeah, I've told the story. I remember walking down to Ash's second round match at Wimbledon with um, her coach, Craig Tizer. Um, and you know when the phone rings and you don't know who it is? You don't know whether to pick it up or not? Right, come on, you know that, Dylan. Yeah. Um, anyway. No, I, I definitely. Pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pick up the phone. And it's one of my life regrets because it was the, um, it was the vice principal who was um, crying into the phone, um, telling me a story about a mum who'd just been in her office crying about her daughter who had been in and out of clinics for depression, um, going to and from school occasionally. Just happened to go to school that day. And she came home and she said to her mum, she goes, mum, do you know that I am enough? And her mum was cooking and was quite distracted and goes, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, do you know I am enough? And mum goes, well, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, there's this guy at school today talking about Ash Barty and Steph Gilmore and Kathy Freeman and so forth. And I've just realised that I've been comparing myself to Annie and Millie and Lucy and um, well, I don't want to do that anymore. It doesn't make me feel good about myself anyway. And I've just realized almost this aha moment that I am enough. And anyway, the mum turned and dropped her plate and, and started crying and, and said to her daughter, oh, that's what I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> and that um, <laughs> story kind of gave me a sense of excitement, I guess, that this, uh, these principles can be taught to everyone, yeah, not just for elite athletes and, and teams and especially today because we've become the most addicted medicated in debt obese adult generation in the history of the planet we've been distracted by this feeling that i'm not enough i'm not good enough if you like and we're const constantly searching and grasping for that feeling um, and at a pretty young age right and in terms of the where the world's at in terms of media and social media and advertising they're pretty massive distractions for for teenagers if you like um, in terms of that craving recognition. So finding that self-worth at a pretty young age is, 
I think a really big opportunity for the planet. Oh, mate, 100%. I couldn't agree more on that. And I think it probably relates to all the points you've said today. But what would you say to someone, you know, at that age or, you know, 20, 25, 30? Um, how important do you think it is to have someone in your life that you can call a mentor um, and to have those, you know, sort of conversations with people that you can rely on for certain different things? Because I know for me, it's it's been huge. And even after chatting with you, um, I know we, we chatted off, uh, off air last week, but you asked me, you know, do you have someone in your life you can go to for that? And my first thoughts were, no, I don't. But then I broke it down and I actually thought about it and I was like, well, I don't have a mentor. I don't have one person that I go to, but I have 10 different people that I go to for different things without realizing they were an unofficial mentor. Yeah, absolutely. And um, they don't have to be official mentors. They can be unofficial. They don't have to be structured. They can be unstructured. They can also be reverse mentors. Um, and to be frank, my kids teach me so much about perspective um, and what's important and whether it's certain books or articles or podcasts or so forth. So it's more about being open, you know, being open to influence and being curious um, to get help and ask questions and that curiosity, if you like, to get other people's perspective. And our lives should become one big giant cafe latte yeah, where we're meeting and discussing um, how we're feeling with others and, and understanding their backstory. Simply by asking someone, tell me your backstory, unlocks so many connections, if you like, and imperfections and vulnerabilities and stories that you can relate to where you can kind of learn from other people's stories. So um, it's so important to be open to that as opposed to being closed and not wanting to admit your frailties or your vulnerabilities or your imperfections or your fears, if you like. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the greatest turnarounds that's required with, uh, with youth culture today, in particular because of the perfection myth and how pervasive that is. There's an amazing study that's been done over the last 50 years, um, kind of tracking the motivations of primary school age kids all over the world. And in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, their number one need or motivation was to be part of a community, yeah, in terms of a friendship group. And I think being rich was 16 and being famous was 17. Well, from the late 90s into the 2000s and into today, the number one need or motivation for primary school age kids is to be famous, to be rich is number two, and to be part of a community is number 17, right? And that's one of the most oh, scariest yeah. statistics I've ever seen in terms of what, what these kids or what this generation is craving in terms of what's important. They're all looking for extrinsic motivations rather than intrinsic. And you'll never find self-worth externally. Yeah, you can only find that internally. So sharing your journey and sharing your imperfections with others and kind of identifying what, other, what, what parts of your life were feeling a bit stuck. And then from there, have a curiosity to ask someone if you could buy them a coffee and just ask them their backstory. Because what you'll find is mentors get more out of it in terms of the serotonin, the oxytocin with contributing to others and helping others be happy. It actually makes you feel happier than the person um, getting the help in the first place. And you'll, you'll realize that everyone on the planet wants to leave a legacy. Yeah, now you can do that by planting a tree, starting a company, starting a family. But one of the easiest ways you can leave a legacy is to impart wisdom onto, something, onto someone else. And once you realize that, yeah, all of us should be advocating, creating a team around us rather than this loner mentality and creating as many mentors as we possibly can. Um, as I said, I have not met a successful person on the planet that doesn't have a huge assortment of mentors in different aspects of their life. And they change and they come in and out of your lives at different stages, depending on what your needs are. Yeah, oh, mate, I, I couldn't agree more. Without officially, like we said before, without officially having a mentor, I look back at all these connections I've made and I suppose um, without knowing this, one of my passions, but I think it's turned into a, a strength is just relationship building and being able to, to connect with people in different industries. Um, and I look back at that now and I, I'm not a great learner. Like I was never really good at school um, in terms of book readings and whatnot. But I think if I look now, I, I knew how to get the answer because I could find the right person who could help me. Um, and I look back now at that and I think that's probably the biggest skill that a young person can have is being able to identify the right person for them. So like you said, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more for, 
for, for people out there to try and find someone that they can connect with. And, and I think it's an important point, um, um, Ben, that sometimes you might be learning from these mentors. It might not be learning what to do, but it might be learning what not to do. Because um, I don't, sometimes I don't, you know, I don't have the answers at all with, with my stuff. I think that I'm on this and I love to chat to people like you to learn, but I think that I can actually teach people mistakes like that I've learned from the past. And I think that's probably the vulnerability side of things um, that I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, totally. We learn so much more about other people's mistakes um, and that creates that sense of humility and humanity and that connection, if you like, that we're, you know, we're all imperfect, if you like, and, what, and the lessons that they learn about themselves and about life is so important as well. And if you can create that um, permission and safety to have those open conversations, as I mentioned, your greatest growth comes from your darkest times because of what it unlocks in terms of learning and, and curiosity, if you like, as well. We don't understand how powerful curiosity is either, Dylan, and it sounds like whether it's your approach to your education or even you know, what you're doing now with the podcast, curiosity is such a powerful antidote for you know, being caught up in distraction and fear and anxiety in these crucible moments. Because you start looking at it from a different perspective, you know, what can I learn through this experience? What can I do di differently? How can this shape me to be a, a better version of myself? So simply just asking those questions and being open and open-minded to that learning is where half the power, the power is, if you like. And that's, as we discussed, that's just called living. And that's the journey that we're all on if you like. So yeah, I'd continue to do whatever you're doing in that sense, Dylan, because it's pretty powerful and it's probably a lesson that the classic stoic Aussie alpha male needs to learn a lot more of is to lean in rather than, rather than lean back. Ben, something that is really um, interesting about yourself, and I, I, I don't know if this is a silly question, but I feel like I need to ask it because you're obviously a, a mentor and a, and a coach to a lot of successful people. Um, how does one acquire your services? Are you, I feel like you're a, you're a CIA agent of, of mentoring and coaching. Like, you know, you're not someone that is, is in a phone book. Um, you don't sort of offer, you don't need to offer your services because it's, I'm guessing a lot of this comes from recommendation from other people. Is it just getting passed on from, you know, when you work with some uh, businessman, they might say, we need you to go to this company now. We want to send you over to this sports club. Is that how it works? <laughs> Good question, Dylan. I'm not really sure how it works. This whole thing's an experiment, if you like. Um, you know, your, your life's a constant work in progress. And yeah, um, it really wasn't a rule book for falling into this as a hobby, more so than a career. Um, as I said, I'm still trying to figure that out. So um, I'm really open and open-minded just to doing different things um, and working in different sports and different countries and, um, and different roles, if you like. And I think that's why I've, I've come back to, we're all in search of that one thing, unconditional love. And the way to find that uh, unconditional love is by um, finding confidence and happiness, by asking yourself those three questions, who am I, what do I want, and, and how do I get there, if you like. Which has unlocked three mindsets that I typically work with with clients, which is connection mindset, purpose mindset, and, uh, and performance mindset is, is the third one. And then the utilization of that and how I can um, get these mindsets out to the world, I guess that's the experiment. And yeah, I've been working exclusively in, in certain sports and leagues with a particular team or a particular athlete. And at the moment I'm kind of thinking, okay, is there a way that I could get some of these themes or messages out to, to the whole world? And whether it's creating an app or a, you know, a podcast or um, you know, um, an event per se, we can start to socialize these themes and start to discuss them as well on a, on a grand scale. So I'm in the process of developing an app, Dylan, to, uh, as a, again, another experiment, uh, a confidence and happiness app to kind of teach the whole world how to be a good human first and a, and a good athlete second. Um, and as I said, I define an athlete as anyone who loves to compete, play and have fun are the three ingredients. So whether you're a teenager, whether you're a CEO or whether you're a professional athlete, we're kind of all in search of those, um, those same two things. So. Um, but let me flip it the other way. Um, assume I, you and I were working together, if you like. Um, y you're going on the same journey that everyone else is to work out who you are and work out what you want in life. Um, and you mentioned that you know, footy didn't define you, it's what you did, it's not who you are, didn't define the depth of, depth of you. Have you been, um, been able to get a bit closer to answering, answering those two questions in terms of what, what lights you up? 
It's it's yeah. Well, as you said, you you did ask me these two questions, and I think it is such a hard it is such a hard question. But when I when I do look at what my purpose is, I think if I look at my purpose, I think it's it's ever changing. But at the moment, I think the podcast has probably pushed me into another way that I never thought would be a purpose. But now that it's shown me something that can have effect on people, and um, it's more just really enlightened my life into thinking, geez, this actually could be something here where I, I never thought it might have been um you know I, I had a chat with you a while back about um not knowing um through vulnerability and just starting the podcast that somehow the show was connected to to some people and to be able to have impact on 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 a listener is something that has changed my life like it's something that you know you would experience all the time and and not to the extent that you have but i, I never realized that something like this could do that um so I think that I'm definitely still learning my purpose. Um, I love having fun and I love just talking to people, and learning their stories. I think, as we said, a part of this, I started this is mainly just to, to talk to people and learn from them um, and also bring people along with it because I think I like to ask questions that seem dumb um, because I think that a lot of people sometimes might be afraid to ask them, um, whereas I'm probably not just because mm. I'm at the stage now where... I realise we're all just humans and, and like you said earlier, um, people that, like yourself that have done incredible things um, love passing on wisdom. Um, so I've learnt that you know, people aren't afraid to be asked hard questions and um, yeah, I'm just learning from it. But in terms of where do I see myself going, um, I, you know, I think in a, in a plan it would just be to, to work and do this. Like I love doing my podcast, I love doing many things. Like I think you said yourself, um, just trying out new things like I say yes to everything just because I think you've got to try everything because you never know if you're going to like it or not um, a few things that I really have realised that I that I want in my life is just recently I've worked out that like I need to live near the beach and I need to live near the ocean and I know that that's sort of a weird thing because it's it's not a purpose thing per se but I think that if that fits into my purpose and that can work through my life. I, I thought I'm sort of basing it around those sort of things as well. So I think there's just many things that are sort of shaping me at the moment to work out what I want to be, um, where I, where I want to be and what I want to do. Um, but I don't think I've, I definitely haven't worked it out as yet. Yeah. And you don't have to have a defined purpose statement per se, Dylan. And purpose mindset, by the way, is are you just here to show up and make a shitload of money and win? Right? Or fundamentally, you stand for something. You believe in something, something that lights you up. There's a legacy you want to leave the world or there's something you're passionate about. Right? Or at your funeral, these are the things that will be celebrated about you at your eulogy. And we're kind of on a lifetime journey to work out what that is and what is our bliss. So whether it's connected to the ocean, reminds you of the best version of yourself and being close to the, you know, the fluidity of water, if you like, brings out the best in you, then that's absolutely part of that journey is, is what does light me up and what am I passionate about? What does excite me, if you like, um, about helping others or what ex excites me about myself and, and bringing out the best in others through, through your story. And I think it's so, um, so important today that there is other media platforms beyond traditional media because we're all craving that, right? We're all craving that sense of human connection and craving vulnerability and craving celebrating imperfection and craving laughing more and more spontaneity and so forth. So if you can do that and champion that through, through your podcast and almost through your vulnerabilities, bring the connection of the audience and obviously the connection with your talent to life as well, because um, we're all on that journey from learning from each other. So yeah, I'd, I'd continue to celebrate that more than anything else because it's a, a, you're not seeing that in, in the way media is being developed today, certainly traditional media and social media to an extent, and obviously the advertising industry. And this is the thing, right? If, if when you wake up in the morning, if you don't own your story, right? If you don't know who you are and, and own that story and create those positive mantras for yourself and you stick your head up in the world, right? The world will tell you who you are. And unfortunately, the three biggest storytellers on the planet right now is the media industry, the social media industry to a degree and the advertising industry. Now, the media industry is predominantly negative, yeah? Certainly news media, yeah? It's a formula, so if you watch tonight's news, 72% of the stories will be negative. But unfortunately, we've also got this negative unconscious bias telling us that we're not good enough or loved enough and so forth, which is just creating this awful cortisol meets dopamine situation. We can't get enough of this negativity, but it makes us feel terrible about ourselves. 
The second biggest storyteller is the social media industry. And because we never learned how to drive the technology 15 years ago, we got too caught up in ourselves and comparing ourselves and became self-absorbed, self-obsessed. You know, we created this thing called a selfie. And unfortunately, as a consequence of focusing on ourselves, we're suffering, right, from an emotional health point of view. But thankfully, you're starting to see, whether it was through the bushfires, we, started, we stopped focusing on ourselves and taking selfies of our feet on a banana lounge and we started caring about the country that was burning down or the welfare of animals or the welfare of communities. And you're seeing now with the pandemic, the wonderful use of social media for a sense of humility and humanity and, and celebrating imperfections and compassion that I believe in the next generation, I'm hoping social media will be designed in the way it was used to in terms of human connection, if you like. And the biggest storyteller of all is the advertising industry. Yeah, and that's predicated on shame. You're not enough until you buy that car or that handbag or that watch and so forth. But it was never designed to do that. It was designed to promote attributes and benefits of products. But it's got so clever in its psychology. Now, they're the three biggest storytellers on the planet. So if you don't own your story and you stick your head up, that's what's going to be you're bombarded with. So finding other outlets, whether it's podcasts such as yourself, where you're not getting caught up in all that negativity and you realize that we're all on this you know, hero's journey and, and, and we're all caught up in these imperfections and vulnerabilities is really, really important. So the relatability, I think uh, I'd continue to do that. Um, can I ask you another question in this kind of reverse therapy session? Please. You know? um, yeah, in terms of your playing career, how did you separate the person from the persona um, sort of thing? Because that's so hard when we get caught up in, in the identity of who we are. I don't think I did um, at all. Uh, I think that that's probably the, the, what sort of kick-started me on this, this journey. And I, I only probably learned this post-football um, and towards the end of my career because I think that, yeah, as you said, I, I don't think I separa- separated them well. I think that, I think I said earlier, like if I played a good game, I was a good person. If I played a bad game, I was a bad bloke. Um, and that was probably where it got to me for a point where I was so up and down, up and down on performance and, and couldn't draw myself out of the, the sporting, um, you know, on-field performance that I was constantly just in these, you know, up and down states where I was just riding this emotional roller coaster. And um, that's probably where it got to a stage for me where I thought, and, and like we said, those crucible moments of, of ending and, and being delisted and, and whatnot was the thought where it goes, well, look, there's two ways I can go about this. I can actually go in and learn why this is the case or, um, you know, you can probably just delve more into it. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, part of the journey is identifying, um, I guess, where our shame came from, where our not enoughness came from and, and kind of let it go and, and do that reframing. Because in any situation or any condition, any um, relationship, we tell ourselves one of two stories. Either I'm enough, yeah, and I've got this, or I'm not enough, or or I haven't got this. And if we tell ourselves that second story, we're effectively creating a vertical relationship between ourselves and and others. And we're all doing this, by the way, all over the world. And a vertical relationship is where you put yourself below others, which at its extreme is an inferiority complex, right? You're not good enough. And, um, or you put yourself above others, which at its extreme is a superiority complex, right? But it comes from the same place, feeling that I'm not enough. And the antidote to these vertical relationships is to start creating these horizontal relationships, wherever you go, in any situation, in any event, in any relationship. Because when you create horizontal relationships, you tell yourself a different story, that, "Uh uh-uh, I am enough, I've got this, I can do this, I can get through this. And when you start creating horizontal relationships everywhere you go, that's when you live from a place of that unconditional self-worth and you realize it's our decisions, not the conditions, that determines our mindset, our self-worth and our attitude. But unfortunately, if if you're not in touch with that, the conditions of your reality can determine your mindset. And that's where we're getting so distracted today as a human race. This effectively means if it's rainy, I'll be shitty. If it's sunny, I'll be happy. Right, which is crazy because we're abdicating yeah. responsibility for living. Yeah? Responsibility by definition is the ability to choose my response in any situation, in any condition. And that's what we mean by unconditional. Right? There's no conditions upon it. But if we tell ourselves a different story, that shame continually shows up in other aspects of our lives when again we tell ourselves that story that I'm not enough something, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, successful enough, yep. when we start comparing ourselves with others. So. The journey we're on is to identify, okay, what's my not enoughness story um, that we created pretty young so I can let it go and reframe it. I totally agree. Because I think a, a question that I got ver- uh, get very 
often, um, especially when I do podcasting and, and even just throughout my career, was the, the main thing people asked me was, did my dad playing ever impact my career? Did like the pressure get too much? Um, you know, was this something that affected the way it was? And I can honestly say it wasn't. Like it had absolutely nothing to do with that whatsoever. It was nothing that ever even crossed my mind um, whatsoever throughout the time. I think that for me, it was just that, you know, I probably, as we said earlier, I don't think it was my why. It was my reason of, you know, I loved playing sport, but did, was it the be all and end all if I didn't win three premierships and get best on that week? And it wasn't. But I think that when you're in a sports industry that gets pretty hard is they trick you to think that it is and they trick you to think that that's what your self-worth is. So I look back now on my career and I'm nothing but proud of it because, um, you know, it was an awesome time and it actually got me to learn all these things that I'm learning now, the relationships and and all these things about myself. I use my career, um, and I, this is why I think of it, is, is like an eight-year uni degree. Basically, I was doing something that I loved for eight years um, learning all these lessons, meeting all these incredible people. And along that time, it was just letting me think what was actually there for me next. Um, and it was buying me time to work out what I wanted to do and what made me happy. Because um, as I said, you know, starting this show, I didn't start this to think that it was going to actually be my job. I started it because I needed to find out something else outside of, um, outside of the game and not be judged on being a, a player, but being judged on a person. And I think that that was the biggest change for me is when people saw me not that you want to you know as we said not that you want to worry about what people think of you but um when people saw me that didn't know me they judged me on my performance on the field or they judged me on not living up to the hype of what you know my my dad was but then they listened to the podcast and they saw that I was a different person and then that was actually what motivated me then because they could they could actually judge me on what what I was and and not what I wasn't Mm. you're listening to that First and foremost, your parents did an amazing job of releasing um, and removing expectations um, because it's expectations that are literally killing the world at the moment, especially these unrealistic expectations of others that might be accidentally or surreptitiously thrust upon us, if you like, that we can't live up to or the expectations of results that we can't control the future as well so i get asked a lot what's the best piece of advice that a parent can give to um to their kids and i said it's the same best advice that a that a coach can give to um, athletes which is those six words i love to watch you play right not to love you win the game or kick six goals or win six love six love it's just i love to watch you play it says so much of the humility and humanity and most importantly unconditional love you learned at a pretty young age there was no conditions based on um, based on who you are and your self-worth it wasn't determined upon how well you play in the sports industry right um, perfection myth gets caught up in enormous drives where um, kids learn that they believe um, unfortunately that their self-worth is determined on how they play if they play the perfect game of of football then their parents will love them and they'll become a perfect perform repeat syndrome sort of thing so the fact that you're able to have a high profile dad who played you know sport at the highest levels but didn't get caught up in you know the expectations of having to um, you know follow in those footsteps for your own self-worth is is quite phenomenal because as I mentioned expectations are are literally killing the world right now and it's about saying "Uh -uh, my self-worth is not determined upon what I do in my life right it's effectively who I am and you can separate the person from the persona but if you can't you'll get distracted by those expectations of others or the persona of who you are. So if, you know, if Dusty Martin or Ash Barty walks down the street and they get recognised as, you know, world number one or, or um, you know, professional football, it's the same thing as Mickey Mouse walking down the street. Yeah, we don't know them. We know the persona of them. So it's really important for Dusty or Ash or anyone to separate the persona from the person to realise if it's not real, therefore it's not personal. So if I'm getting, you know, uh, abused in media or social media, if it's not real, it's not personal, then I can get back to what is real my relationship with myself or with my family or my friends. But, you know, by virtue of playing in the AFL, 17 out of 18 people are going to hate you by virtue of playing for a particular franchise. So understanding the rules of engagement is is really, really important, um, especially from a self-worth point of view as well. So, um, yeah, all credit to you folks, Dylan, in terms of being able to separate um, your self-worth from that.
Ben, at the moment, obviously, we're in a pandemic. Um, we're both in Victoria as well, which is probably, uh, well, it's obviously the hardest hit in Australia. What have you learnt and what are your observations of how people have sort of been tra- uh, travelling and, and the mindset of people at the moment? Yeah, I got asked early on how my work has, has changed since the, uh, since the pandemic first hit. Um, the work with athletes quickly shifted from performance coaching to uh, life coaching, um, which to be fair was always part of the gig, but typically, you know, athletes don't want to talk about life after sport while they're still playing. So typically athletes hate it and, and I love it in terms of the, um, you know, the higher order perspective in terms of being a good human first and a good athlete second. But with a lot of the CEOs and executives that we work with, the work shifted almost the other way from more holistic leadership and life coaching to performance coaching. <laughs> Because dare I say it, life itself is a performance right now, Dylan, and we are so distracted by the things we can't control, by wanting to control it. It's probably the biggest macro theme at the moment is as humans, we don't do uncertainty very well. And as a consequence, we don't do vulnerability very well. Or we're catastrophizing the end result. Yeah, when will this end? How much money will I lose? How many people will be killed? Will we find a vaccine? Will my, will my parents be okay? And they're all important considerations. But when they become your focus of attention, it distracts you from the things you, you can control in the best version of you. And focusing on something you can't control but wanting to control it is the definition of anxiety. Yeah, it's the definition of pressure or stress or worry. So it's been really important to identify what's my flavor of distraction, yeah, and then let it go. And then focus my attention on the things I can control and what the best version of me looks like so I can kind of win the morning and and win the day. But I've been asking a lot of my clients of late. um, In fact, I'll be interested to ask you this this question as well before I give you the answer. Um, I said, look, regardless of you, whether you're religious or you believe in God, uh, I said, let's just assume for the purpose of the exercise, the world's trying to tell us something at the moment through this pandemic. Um, What do you reckon she's she's trying to say? So from your perspective, Dylan, what, what do you reckon the world's trying to tell us at the moment or teach us at the moment through this uh, experience that we're all going through? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think um, for me, I think I've thought about this a fair bit, actually. And I think it shows that the things that we're missing are the things that are human connection um, and our relationships. And, and the things that we're not missing, I think, are those things that we probably don't need, like new cars or um, spending money or um, buying new outfits. Um, it's probably simplified things just to show that the really important things in life are just your family and friends and those human connections and just being able to... To, to catch up with people, which is something that I've really missed um, in this time. And I think that also, and I, I'd be interested to get your opinion, and I hope this is right, but um, I think that it's just another crucible moment in our lives. And I think it's like you said, it's, it's post-traumatic stress or it's um, post-traumatic growth. Um, there's, there's two ways that you can sort of go when these things happen. And it's either you can get better and you can adapt through it. And everyone's in different circumstances. A lot of people are, you know, a lot worse off than others, but... I think that it's not what happens, it's how you react to it sometimes. And as bad a situation you're in, you can always, you can be in a bad situation and you can be negative about it, or you can be in a bad situation and you can be positive about it. Um, and I think, you know, I've heard you speak a lot about a lot of businesses in, in this time that um, so many things of beauty and so many things of creation can actually happen in these times of stress because it simplifies things and shows people what we really need. Um, in life, I think uh, Uber was created um, back in the last um, financial crisis. Um, a lot of other apps and, and businesses as well. So um, it's something. And I feel really bad saying this, and it's not. I'm not meaning this in a disrespectful way, but it sort of excites me a little bit because I think, well, if we can do these things now and think positively now and get through these really hard times, once we're out of it, we're going to be flying. Wow! Beautiful answer. Um, you don't want a job, do you, Dylan, uh, grasshopper? Uh, there's, there's one waiting for you as a professional mentor. Um, yeah, that's um, yeah, beautiful, an- <laughs> beautiful answer. I don't think I could add too much to that, by the way. Um, I've been asking all my clients that same question, right? And it's been fascinating, the consistency of their responses in relation to everything you just said, right? The number one thing everyone's talking about in this kind of reset is just to slow down. Yeah, slow down. We've become so addicted to being busy with this information technology revolution that our brain, let alone our bodies and emotions, can't, can't stack up with, right? So these human doings versus human beings. So the ability just to be present 
you know, so the work that, you know, Hugh Van Kylenbergs and other people are doing around, you know, mindfulness, around being, being calm and present and just listening to the things around you is, is so important. And the second one is about connection, reconnecting to family, to friends, reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with yourself, which is probably one of the biggest opportunities through this chapter is to have that self-reflection and introspection, the courage to work out who you are, um, to find that sense of appreciation and you know, being appreciative for what we've got rather than focusing on what we haven't got. If you like, and right now you and I are both appreciative of the things we can't do at the moment, right? whether it's go swim in the ocean or, or connect with, with family and friends. Then I asked them, before the pandemic hit, what were you stressed about? Right? What was keeping you up at night and so forth? And everything they were stressed about was all extrinsic, you know, the, how much money they were earning or not earning and what their status was in their role in the business or in the company and, um, and kind of that recognition, if you like, for motivation or how recognized they were. But everything they want was intrinsic. So in terms of one of the biggest distractions that's happening to us at the moment, and by the way, extrinsic motivations aren't bad. We need money and, and shelter and so forth for, um, to live in. But when they become exclusive to the detriment of intrinsic motivations, they'll never make you happy. They'll never light you up. Right? And especially since the, um, the Royal Commission into Banking in Australia, there's this entire generation of 50 plus alpha males who have woken up and they've achieved, but they're not fulfilled. Yeah, they're extrinsically motivated to the detriment of intrinsic motivations, you know, what really lights them up in, in, inside. And, you know, the kids have all grown up and left home and they're kind of thinking, she's what just happened to the last two decades? You know, where was my focus of attention? Where was my perspective? What was important in my life? And I'm kind of hoping through this, um, through this reset and excited in the same way that you are, that will realize in that post-traumatic growth what really is important and work out some of the answers to those questions about what do I want and who am I really and let go of giving a shit what people think about me as what I think about myself and, and slowing down and, and connecting if you like. So that's really the, the opportunity I see coming out the other side of this whenever we'll be uh, allowed to, to go outside again in this state of disaster which obviously is a physical state, but hopefully it's not a, mi a mindset state of disaster as well. Mate, it's, it's fantastic. And I absolutely love everything you said there. People um, like myself, I wanna, I wanna gonna, are gonna wanna get a lot more um, of your work. Uh, on Mojo Expresso, Friday mornings, we can on Instagram Live, which is something that's been awesome that you're doing. I love, I love seeing that on, on Instagram. How can we access you more? How can we see your stuff? Um, how can we learn more about yourself and about your work? Um, yeah, well, this has been a, a new experiment for me to kind of go a bit public um, with some of these thinking and some of these principles and so forth. So, um, yeah, so uh, we have an a Instagram page, Mojo Crow, um, which will eventually spread out into, um, you know, potentially a podcast. And as I mentioned, we're in the process of building a, a confidence and happiness app um, to teach the whole world how to be a good human first. and. Um, you know, a good athlete second and kind of unlock the, the, these three mindsets around connection and, and purpose and performance mindset as well. So hopefully in the next few months, um, Dylan, once I, can, uh, once I can get out there and start interviewing a lot of the athletes and individuals that, um, that I want to kind of share their stories, if you like, we'll be able to launch this app. But yeah, in the, in, in the meantime, yeah, probably more the, the social channels and so forth and just going on interesting podcasts like yourself who are like-minded around perspective and mindset uh, I'll, I'll start showing up occasionally on, on some of their podcasts as well mate it's been incredible um i honestly cannot wait for your podcast if that is true and that's coming out um i think we're all going to be pretty worried about the the reviews of that one because that'll be up the top for sure um you've you've done so many incredible things and i can't wait to see what you've got next in your journey i can't thank you enough um obviously for coming on the show mate it's been let alone for everyone else listening, um, I sort of zoned out and just treated it as a, a consultation for myself. And um, I'm going to go away and, and write about a few essays on, on what I need to improve on and, and what I can get better and where my purpose is and, and who am I. Um, you've really asked a lot of questions of it. Um, again, mate, I thank you so much uh, and really looking forward to what's next for, for yourself. Thank you so much, Dylan. As I said, huge congratulations on, on what you're doing with the, the podcast and getting your story out and getting other people's stories out as well. So. Um, you know, vulnerability and purpose are probably the two most important themes on the planet right now um, to find that sense of connection. So, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. And more importantly, I'm going to put a merchandise order on uh, after we finish this, oh, uh, this episode as well. So, 
um, yeah, hopefully I'll be wearing Dylan and Friends merchandise around Melbourne town. Gee whiz, that is, uh, that's way to, once one way to finish, mate. That's made my day, and we will sort that out very soon. Yeah.